Okay. So once we have our structures and patterns and our judgments, we have to protect them. The first two create the third one, resistance to change. Guess what? We're not born this way. It's comfortable. You're hearing a theme? I'm going to be, this is where the test is coming in later, all right? I'm going to ask you to do something right now because it's time to stand up anyway. Stand up, please. I want you to pick up your stuff, whatever your stuff is, and I want you to move to a different seat and not the one right next to you. <laughs> and feel, stretch your legs while you're doing it. They said not next, right next to you. That's right next to you. Actually, I was, I was trying to tick you off, but I think you were happy to move. <laughs> Did anybody, what was the first thing that came through into your head when I said, go to a different seat, not the one next to you? What was the first thing that popped into your head? I don't want to do this. Why are we doing this, right? Thank you. That was the right answer. Uh, you've only been in those seats for an hour, and you think you own them? An hour! And you got your comfort zone. You got your... Nice warm button there, and it's all, you know, now you're on somebody else's butt warm. <laughs> it's like foreign butt warm. This is why we did this, okay, is we've got to get comfortable with being uncomfortable, yin and yang, okay? The back to the yin-yang. It's related to the other two barriers, like I said. We don't even like positive change. Human beings would just as soon lay in a fur-lined rut, okay? Did you ever try to go on a diet? Did you ever try to quit smoking? Did you ever try to ex an exercise program? All these things that you actually want to do. And what happens? The diet industry is a trillion dollar industry because we don't change. There's a new diet every week, okay? So this is why programs in organizations fail because somebody just tells you to change seats. We don't have any idea why. The why is the motivation, okay? People will go to the conferences like this or to an executive retreat and they'll sit in a room and they'll say, we need to have a Six Sigma quality program, okay? How are we gonna do that? Well, we're gonna send people to training. Okay, we send them to training, then you guys are all out there in the little quality circles. You're going, why are we doing this? That's the motivation. We need to start with the why, okay? It's a whole different workshop, but, but th that's why we resist change, is because we want to stay comfortable. It's called the pain and the gain of change. That's where we want to be, in our old seats. Every time you go through change of any kind, even if you initiate it or somebody else initiates it, your first step is denial. I don't need to change seats. I was perfectly fine here. And now you're in confusion. It's like, well, now I'm sitting somewhere else. I, was just, I, I use the analogy of my first computer back in the 80s. Back in the 80s when I started First Step, you know, I, I, computers weren't as prevalent. You might not have you know, born yet, but I had a brother memory typewriter. I was high tech. And I would type up all these programs and workshops and overhead transparencies. Does anybody remember those? It was a big bulb, with a, okay? And I would drive them to Kinko's. And I'd pay, this is back in 86, I'd pay somebody $35 an hour back in 1986 to make my slides and my handouts. It was a word processor. I'd drive back home, edit them, red line, take them back, drive back, change them, take them back home, and I thought this was efficient. It was comfortable. I didn't have to learn how to use a computer. Then one of my best friends, my first clients at WQED, had a Mac, a monochrome Mac 
with a hard drive about this big. <laughs> and it was 20 meg. <laughs> and he said, John, you got to see this. It's so cool. You, you don't need to be doing all this Kinko's and driving and paying all that money. I said, oh, no, I'm fine. Where I, got, I, got a, I got a lady at Kinko's, handles it. Don't worry about it. Finally, at the end of the year, I was doing my ta taxes, and I saw how much I'd spent at Kinko's over the past year. And I called Dave, I said, how much is one of those computers? And he says, oh, they're not much at all. So I went and I bought a used one, a used Mac at 86. <laughs> and I said, OK, I'll try it. Well, as soon as I could turn it on and I couldn't figure out, oh, this is, this is no good. I don't know. If, that was where I was before with a brother typewriter. Then I turned it on, and I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I thought if you, you know, I just, I just didn't know anything. So I finally got over the hump saw how cool it was, and then they came out with version 1.2 of WordPerfect, okay? I was feeling good about myself, back in my comfort zone, and then bam, I gotta get a new version of WordPerfect? No, I don't need that, the old one works fine. And you go around and around and around this thing all the time. But if you always stay here, you never will grow. You never will learn, you never will develop, and you become narrow. That's why the older you get, the more weirdos there are. Because our comfort zone gets narrower and narrower and narrower. And life stinks. It really does. This is, a, I think, a, a, a big point that I, I really want you to get. You know, stress, we talked about the stress thing at the very beginning. All stress is rooted in a perceived lack of control. Think about it. You didn't have control over me telling you to change seats. That was a little stressful. All stress is rooted in a perceived loss of control. And I said perceived. You don't have to not have control. If you want to have control, you initiate the change. <laughs> don't be a victim of change. Be a victor. Let other people have the stress. Okay? And you can do that. It's, it's a matter of of learning how to get uncomfortable. So let's go back to the common denominators. What were the two things that were common in all three barriers? Not born that way, and it's comfortable. Exactly. So how do we fix it? How do we fix it? We got to become more of what we were, tapping your natural weirdness. The greatest thing in life is to die young but to delay it for as long as possible. George Bernard Shaw. This is a study, a huge study, done in the days of the, uh, the beginning of the Head Start program. This is so revealing. This is the nine dots. This is the coloring book. They gave 1,600 children tests of divergent thinking, which means out of the box, all right? When they were aged three to five, 98% scored genius. They're coloring outside the lines. We haven't fixed them yet, right? By the age five, by five years later, age eight to 10, it would drop to 32%. We got a hold of them, we fixed them. Five years later, 10%. And then by the time they got to be our age, 200,000 adults were given the same test over 25 and only 2%. Once you hit 25, it's over. You're fixed. You're all fixed. Now. This is not aging, it's conditioning. We can change it, we can fix it. It's called childlike thinking, all right? And we're gonna practice some of it. My agent on the first book, you know, when he read my writing style, I thought he captured it really well. He said, you have a playful style. And I thought, that's really cool, I like that. Playful, like a kid. Doesn't mean childish, it means weird, okay? Not, not restricted. Now, there's another thing that I thought was interesting in this study. They said that the average adult only asks about six questions a day, whereas the average child asks about 125. You know, why, 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 right? <laughs> They're still curious. They're still curious. What they say is that in a beginner's mind, somebody who's new at whatever it is, there are numerous options, numerous solutions, but in an expert's mind, there are very few.